My name is Carl Creason. But this program is what we call our past meets present. So this program is really just investigating different historical events. So, um, today, we are covering World War II. Now, for, I, I've got to start off by giving some um, parameters and um, to some degree setting your expectations properly. Um, what, what the plan is, is what the plan from the beginning was was not to actually study the events of the war itself, but to explain how the war unfolded. If you've ever, and many of us have, um, looked at World War II, it often, usually due to time constraints, comes across um, truncated. Everybody's kind of struggling, World War I, crazy man Hitler comes along, People got buck wild crazy in Japan, and then stuff happened. And then the war happened on these dates. And okay. But when you look at events from 1919 to 1939, and then 41 for the Pacific, what you find is a very intricate, complicated um, setting in which the geopolitical structure of Europe. Um, and the world was deeply intertwined. And so that was what I really wanted to study, to examine for us. By Wednesday of this past week, it was apparent to me that there's no way I could do all that at the level I wanted to do it in the time we have here. Now, some of you were here in 2017 at the old library when we did World War I at the anniversary of the US entry. And that, back then, they had us going for three, three and a half hours. And that was a slog. That was a slog for me. It was a slog for all the participants. So over the years, we've said, yeah, we're, we're not going to do that. We're going we're to put ourselves back, and maybe an hour and a half is a good amount of time. So finally, on Wednesday, I contacted my contact here, Jeremy, and I said, I'm not going to make it. Well, coincidentally, um, we have a program every month, second weekend of the month, almost always, unless there's something at the library. Our December program, our presenter, his wife, is having a baby. They're having a C-section. It's wonderful. And so we, Jeremy and I, had decided, well, we'll just cancel that date because we didn't have anything to take his place until Wednesday. So what's going to happen, and I know some of this may be disappointing for some of you, and maybe some of us struggle, just letting you know ahead of time, let's we'll set your expectations correctly, is we're going to begin walking our way towards the war, and we'll get to the early 1930s today. And in December, we're going to keep going till we get into the war itself. But at no point, and this may be disappointing for some of you, so I apologize on the front side if you feel like that's what the program was supposed to be. Any, any titling and wording, that, that's my fault. Um, at no point are we going to look at the battles. We have before. We've talked about uh, Midway. Um, we're going to, actually, this is a long time off, next December, which our, our day here falls on December 7th, we're going to do the whole Pearl Harbor experience. Um, so we'll go you know, back in that day and look at what was going on in Japan, but we'll end up looking at the battle itself, what happened at Pearl Harbor, and that kind of a thing. Um, so, let me say also that World War II is, um, I think, a struggle, or hmm, it, it's a challenge to look at, because it was, it is our last great confrontation, and for the United States, it's, it's an event that we come out looking really good in. We perceive ourselves as the people who kind of saved the day, we're the heroes, and there's a lot of positive, and there, there's room for some of that interpretation in the process. And that's what makes going into this so difficult, because it is the job of the historian to be neutral. Again, I could just say, Hitler's a crazy man, and really nobody would disagree with me, and we can go from there. And yet, that misses the historical insights that I believe we need to draw from what happens in Germany in this time period. Also, we could just say Japan was crazy, that was stupid, they shouldn't have attacked us, we're minding our own business, one day everything was cool, the next day they bombed us in Pearl Harbor. And that equally would be insufficient in our examination. So it's very difficult for Americans sometimes to hear this kind of examination because they're to some degree confronted with facts and hard truths that the evidence shows us that they may not like. Um, because again, we want to perceive our heroes as heroic. We don't want to see the complexities in the process. Particularly, we want our villains to be villainous. And if it turns out they're just human, 
and then that means they're somewhat like me, and then I have to confront that, you know, that's really challenging. This is gonna bug me the whole time. I'm really sorry. So I wanted to let you know that for many of us, this is a personal experience. Um, this is my dad when he's three years old. This is 1941, before Pearl Harbor. My three uncles, the oldest of the family of 12, all went and fought the war. Um, the three oldest daughters also participated as nurses. All three of them ended up marrying somebody they met far from our hometown in East Tennessee, and their whole lives changed because of this. Um, this is my Uncle Rick, uh, Uncle Rick here. I'm sorry, this is Uncle Mike here. Uncle Mike was the oldest of the family. He entered the United States Navy before the war actually even began and was on the USS Sims, which at that time was in the Atlantic. And then as the war was beginning, was on its way to be transferred over to Pearl Harbor. He just missed being there by about a week. The Sims was out at sea before December 7th. If you know your U.S. history, your naval history, or you were here last year when Professor Griffith did Coral Sea in Midway, you may know that the U.S. Sims was one of the ships that was sunk at the Battle of Coral Sea. My uncle had transferred off six weeks before they set out for Coral Sea to go into the submarine aspect of the Navy. He's in the war the whole time, never really went higher than just an average seaman. Um, and for his entire life afterwards, he never spoke about it at all. When I did a family history and did a DOD request on information for my three uncles, one day out of the middle of nowhere, I got a package in the mail from the Department of Defense. I'm like, what is this? And I opened it up and it was like six medals. And they were all basic medals from a sense of participation, which a lot of the soldiers get. But nonetheless, I later that summer went to my family reunion, presented them in a nice shadow box to my cousin, because Uncle Mike had passed away. And he broke into tears and he said, I never knew that any of this was him. So for his entire life, even his own son didn't know. Uncle Rick here in the middle was by all accounts and family's point of view, the smartest. And so he actually got tapped for an uh, officer training school and never actually went to sea. And for the rest of his life, whenever the brothers were around, even though he was the richest in the family and the quote unquote most successful, it was interesting to watch a great man shrink back out of his own sense, I would say shame, but certainly his own sense of acknowledgement that I didn't actually go fight and my two brothers did. Um, he was a great man, I loved Uncle Rick, he was wonderful. He also never talked about his experience. And then this gentleman here is my Uncle Jess. Jess was youngest of the three, ended up going in as you can see, and was selected to become a fighter pilot, which was the premier spot. Um, served off the USS Shangri-La um, in 44, was over the Philippines, and then eventually was in the final attacks going in with Okinawa, and was in Tokyo Bay. Um, one of the family lore was that, you know, he, all the flybys when they were doing the signatures at the end, he was one of the many fighter planes up there flying across Japan saying, hey, we won. He stayed in, went career, um, and served in Vietnam, and uh, Korea and Vietnam you know, on, a, on, a, on a, one of our aircraft carriers as a, as a kind of lead, the lead um, captain, I suppose, would be commander for the Air Force. So I show you my uncles so that you know when I'm telling you something that may suggest the villains in the story are not quite as villainous as we think, or that there's complexity to it. I'm not trying to somehow um, step on your uncle or grandparents or maybe great-grandparents' experience um, to suggest that their feelings were not valid or that somehow you know, there's something you should think lesser of them. Um, it's very personal for me. I've always loved World War II as a sense, as a sense of study and examination. When I was a kid, I played video games and, and war games that did it, which can tell you a lot about me. It may not be the best thing to have done, but I was in love with the whole process. I was, I was alive and well during the bicentennial, and we celebrated a lot of the things of pro-America and World War II is a piece of that. Now, again, it's complex, though, and, and sometimes people might say, well, why should we study it other than the rah-rah factor for the U.S.? And I would just suggest that there's some reasons that I want to just briefly kind of point out as we, before we kind of dive in to say, well, why are we sitting here? Other than just say, let's have a day where we celebrate how wonderful the U.S. is in winning this, this major event. And um, so what well, one is, perhaps most importantly, is that so often people perceive or feel like, not so often, people feel like maybe we are teetering towards something else that's similar. And so one of the reasons we study history at all 
is to gain evidence of the past. Now, I'm in the camp that says history does not repeat itself, but it leaves patterns and clues. And so if I can learn to read the patterns and I can look for the clues, then I can see potential things coming. No differently than as living in Florida, we know hurricanes come, we watch things, we have different scientific instruments that help us. We can see when things are coming from the clues and the patterns that we know. And so that's helpful for us. But I also love World War II, perhaps as we look at what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, or we just know that it is happening. Because for many people, and this was really true last year when the, when the invasion happened, there's a sense in which they have an incorrect perception of what World War II did. And the incorrect perception is that World War II brought world peace. And since World War II, we've been at peace. Then I can look at a few ne'er-do-wells, guys in a plane in early 21st century, or crazy man in Moscow, and I perceive them as being abnormal and walking us out of our period of peace towards conflict. And so when you ask many Americans, their perception is, well, we've not had any wars. And again, these people, you know, uh, the Putin or others, they're, they're the terrible people because we've been at peace. That's, that's why we want to say World War II, because we brought peace to the world. This is a legacy of Woodrow Wilson's concept that democracies will bring us peace. It does not. Yes, sir? Korea. What about Vietnam? Give me a chance. Yeah, that's what I would say to those people, right? Well, yeah. it's wrong to say that. Well, then they'll back up and they'll say, well, okay, to your point, we've had a few issues here and there. And again, we've been the good guys helping bring world peace, these major events that the world's in. And this is the totality. So again, we look incorrectly at what happened in 1939, 1945, and say, well, here's where we are. Well, I'm again, um, this is an incomplete list of all the wars that have been fought since 1945. I say incomplete because I just didn't have time. I went through four or five sources and I didn't have enough time to dig in. And many people might look and know of a specific thing and go, wait a minute, that's not on that list. So I'm not trying to give you a complete list, but that ought to be a shocking sense to us. But if I know the human species, actually it's not shocking. Because I say, this is kind of who we are. Whether I like that or not, not the point. The, the point is that we need to understand kind of who we are so we can make wise decisions forward. This is, by the way, this sense of there's not wars until these, you know, so this is, and again, oh, that's the first great war in Europe when Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, first of all, they did it in 2014, not 2022. And my kind of sick kind of joking about it was, I'm sure all the people in Belgrade and Kosovo were shocked when they saw the news report saying there had been no wars in Europe since World War II. But this is similar because after the Napoleonic Wars, you'll have people in that period of 1815, 1819, uh, 1914, I'm sorry, and historians, even to this day, talk about that 99 years as a period of peace. And this, again, is an incomplete list, mostly European-focused list of conflicts. So my point is, we want to examine World War II because we want to be able to grasp um, aspects of who we are as a society and from my point of view, begin to say, can I read signals that I need to be aware of? If I don't know how to understand the weather and there's a potential hurricane, I will do nothing to prepare. Or worse, I'll make poor decisions like running to Publix on the day it's supposed to come. <laughs> don't be that person. And if you're a longtime Floridian, you wouldn't be because you've got everything you already know you need or you saw it a week out and you said, oh, let me pick another gallon of milk. Because you knew. Read the patterns. All right. Preamble's over. Hopefully this mic will stay with me. To understand World War II, we have to understand World War I. Well, we're not going to go into World War I in depth. But the short version of World War I is that over the previous hundred years, since the time of the Napoleonic Wars, 
a variety of philosophies had taken over, and we call these loosely the isms, ISS, ISM, meaning liberalism, conservatism, nationalism, romanticism, imperialism, urbanism, these all hit Europe and the world at this moment. I jokingly tell my students it's like Macbeth's witches and they're pouring in things into the brew. There's some imperialism and here's some romanticism and here's some socialism and they're stirring it around and creating a concoction. And that concoction is going to explode over Europe in 1914. 1914's war was brutal, harsh, somewhat unexpected as to on the battlefield. That list of wars that I showed you, particularly from the Prussian, then German point of view, most of their recent battles have been really quick, a seven-week war. The war with France in 1870 lasted a year, but technically on the battlefield, it was over in a month. It was just the French wouldn't surrender in Paris. So from the German point of view in 1914, they're assuming quickly. But what everybody had mistaken and not understood was how much industrialism was going to change the battlefield and the technology of the information, technology of the battlefield, outstripped the tactics of the battlefield. By 1917, everybody's teetering on chaos. We all know what happens to Russia, which I'll show you another slide in just a second. But in general terms, um, this was possible for every place, including England, including France. Well, in that time, obviously, as you know, Germany makes a gamble. It does not pay off in their gamble. And when this happens and it doesn't pay off, it brings the United States into the war. Hence, like I said, in 2017, we did a whole long series here on the war, and then later we came back and looked at what happened at the Treaty of Versailles. This gives Wilson his chance to kind of ride to the rescue, and he began to, um, I would suggest, warp some pretty deep American values um, connected to our old Puritan concept of city on a hill, which to that point had been the idea that we're going to create a society that is emulatable, and if you want to know how we did it, we will tell you, to flipping over to we have created a society that you should have, and we're going to come make you have it. And if you ever wonder or worry or get frustrated with what you perceive to be how, quote-unquote, American exceptionalism gets imposed in places, and if you find that upsetting, then Wilson is the person to get upset with. Although he's not alone. It's really a progressive concept of these people are less off. They're, they're not as, in, as, in, as, in as stable a setting. We should go help them and save them. You can arguably say the Spanish-American War was that kind of an event. So in the process then, Wilson sets out and says, we want to remake the map of the world. We're going to create a new world order. With New World Order, he would have said, was basically a world safe for democracy, and a world of democracies will have no war. Well, if you pay attention from 1945 to 2023, the democracies have been on the rise. Most places in the world would claim to be some version of a democracy. And as you saw from the list earlier, we've had nothing but war, although that's not an aberration. It's just saying that that idea of a government of democracy somehow providing us a a bulwark against warfare is misguided and has now a hundred and something years later been proven false. The treaty experience at Versailles was horrific. And if you've been around me more than once in some of these talks, we've covered this at length. The treaty of Versailles to me is the answer when you want to try to understand what's going on in the world geopolitically. So Russia, Ukraine, treaty of Versailles. Now there's steps to get there, but I can explain it to you. And what happened to the Treaty of Versailles is that an opportunity goes wanting. The opportunity was for the Europeans there to have decided to do what they did in 1815 or in 1648 or in most of the geopolitical diplomatic moments between 1648 and 1919, which was work collectively, even with my enemy at the table, to create a peace that we go forward from. Instead, perhaps Wilson might have been at the stem of this. It's not totally sure. I actually think Clemenceau, the leader from France, probably is the person who really pushed this agenda. Germany's not included. Their ally, the USSR, is not included. Austria is not included. The largest Muslim nation, the Ottoman Empire, is not included. So a decision was made to establish a peace without all the participants being at the table. And as you can see, 
from Italy's point of view and Japan's point of view, they leave frustrated. Now again, let me, let me try to, maybe I didn't say this well in the preamble. Not only am I saying do we want to understand World War II and World War I, the point is, is that all of the participants who we will see kind of lead us to the explosion uh, that we call World War II are grappling with negative outcomes and situations from this moment. So as we're going along, if you have a loose grasp of World War II, oh, the, you know, the Russian, the USSR, and Italy, and Japan, and that's who's involved. Just keep paying attention how often you're going to see their names in this setting. So in 1919, Japan, who was a deep ally of the UK, and Italy, who had changed sides, and the reason they changed sides was because they wanted more land that had belonged to Austria at the time than they wanted anything from France. So it was better for them to be on that side and not help Germany leave frustrated. They don't leave frustrated after the, the, the document's signed, they leave before it's signed because they're not included in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So already in 1919, before the peace is signed, you have two nations who have walked away unhappy. And when they walk away unhappy, and you've been there personally in events and opportunities and moments, whether in business or in personal life, for some of us, Retribution and payback kind of gets into our mind. If nothing else, I'm no longer thinking in a positive way about this other being, person, group, company that I've been engaged with. And so you already have this setting where two key players of what's going to be coming are frustrated with us. And so in the impact of this, chaos basically ensues. Instead of there being a sense of a positive outcome where everybody's happy, we kind of go our own way, and there's a sense of joy in the process. Everybody's unhappy. The UK and France are broken economically and psychologically. The US is gonna go drink its problems away in the quote unquote roaring 20s, but have basically shifted its viewpoint back to a pre-progressive ideology of we don't get involved. Now, just so you know, I, I usually don't like to use the term isolationist with the United States, because that comes across in a negative vein. That idea of the United States saying we don't want to be involved, particularly in Europe's issues, is the founding idea of our foreign policy back to George Washington, what I call the Washingtonian doctrine. It was Washington's view that our focus is at best to be trading partners. However, having gone in as Wilson does to remake the map of the world and create a new world order, it was quite disappointing and undercutting to the whole system when all of a sudden, that group saying we're going to create this does not participate later. Germany's in free fall and chaos. When, when the thing is signed, they basically, I'll go back to this, uh, they, they basically fly the flags in Berlin at half mast. They can't believe how harsh this document is. Italy immediately is going to run into a Civil War-esque situation between some of its political parties, and the USSR is going to fight a Civil War, as is the Ottoman Empire. That Ottoman Empire situation, if you're paying attention today, and you know our complicated relationship with Turkey, particularly relative to the Kurds, but to ISIS, to Syria, that whole scenario there, the reason it's complicated is this failure right here. This is the reason. And we can't escape it until we, to some degree, in my opinion, go back and kind of fix that process. So let's break it down into smaller pieces. The Russian Civil War. I'm not a fan of Mr. Putin, but at the same time, I could, if we were doing a talk on Russia, Ukraine, give you a very logical and I think fulfilling explanation as to what he's doing and why. And it's not merely just because he's a thug or a dictator wannabe or you know something like that. From the Russian point of view, they can make the argument and do that they've been the, the, the kid who gets picked on in school for the past thousand years. And they look at a variety of situations, including the Civil War, in which nearly every significant country, including the United States, will send troops into Russia to fight on the side of the whites. Now, we can make the argument that we were doing that because of anti-communism. That's totally fine. I'm not saying we shouldn't send troops places. 
But when the USSR in 1921 or 1939 signs a non-aggression pact with the Germans, we shouldn't somehow act like, well, they're just being evil. Why aren't they friends with us? And part of their answer would be because you've never been friends with us. And again, loosely stated the West, of which the United States is part of, Russia can make the argument that, look, we have to invade Ukraine because you're invading us, which is his whole argument about NATO. It's a whole different conversation. Again, I'm not saying he's right. I'm just saying you can build an argument that explains it, and I think that's useful for us if we're really truly trying to grasp the setting, try to understand the process. In the end, as we know, the Reds, the Communist Party, the Bolsheviks will win with Lenin at the fore. They will begin in the process of trying to consolidate their revolution, which is started in 17, but they're not really in a place they can consolidate until 21 when the war is over in the process. Um, it's a bloody war. What happens next will be equally as bloody. And this, by the way, provides a clue for us relative to a Russian viewpoint, perhaps you might say, of the value of life, or their willingness to say, if my citizens have to go die for X reason, I'm good with that. You and I don't have to like that, and you may be or know somebody who is Russian who says that's not their viewpoint, personally, and I certainly would hope that's true. But nonetheless, when you look historically, you see the Russian peoples and the peoples around them so when you say, why is Ukraine not letting up on their point, if you're somebody who says, hey, we should not get involved, we shouldn't spend money on that, well, from the Ukrainian point of view, since 1919, when they were supposed to be an independent nation, and really before that to some degree, they felt they were the ones who were attacked from the Russians. So there's this kind of interplay of nationalism, of where the boundaries would be, of self-determination, that's kind of in this process. Lenin dies in 24, and after an internal fight with Trotsky and a few others, Stalin comes out on top. He begins the process of trying to create an economic foundation that will sustain where they're going, they're trying to put Marx's ideas into action. And so he does it with a thing he called the five-year plan. Well, the basic idea of the five-year plan is we're going to use force to create an industrial society. Now, ultimately, in my opinion, one of the outcomes of World War II is that Stalin will ultimately pull this off. So that when you get to 1945, the USSR is clearly the number two industrial nation in the world, and their output of a variety of things is high. But it comes at a massive human cost. It comes in a struggle over places like the Baltic lands, places like Belarusia, places like Georgia and Ukraine, where they're already kind of struggling through those issues of who's in control, and there will be, we would say, land theft, they would say consolidation, in which they were determined to kind of force people into an industrial society. If you remember Marx, Marx is writing about the proletariat, the workers of the world uniting. Well, in the USSR, and the same thing will happen in China, that's not their setting. So it's a struggle for both Stalin and later Mao to try to pull this off in the more agrarian rural setting that they're in. Stalin's aim is not only to try to match the West in its industrial abilities, which again, he will not pull off until the war, but the war will help him get there. But he's also trying to get into a setting where he can basically be using, we might say Marx's roadmap as to how they do then set up this communist society where everything's equal and nobody has any private property in the process. And again, just so you know, we're gonna go back and we're trying to stay chronological and we're going back and forth a lot of different states. So Italy's also unhappy. The why they're unhappy is on this map. It's hard to see, but can you see these little dotted lines over here? What Italy believed they'd been promised in their secret agreement with the British and French was all this land. Now, you and I know that this is obviously the future Yugoslavia and today, you know, Montenegro, Croatia, Serbia is more over here. But all this land is, is, we might say, Baltic land, and you might say not Italian land. But the Italians, who had only unified as a nation in 1861, Rome, it takes to 70 before they finally get everything. But in 61, they're a nation for the first time. So technically, Italy is a very young nation. But in their ideology and their identity, they perceived themselves with an ancient history, clearly, going back to Rome. 
And of course, from a Roman point of view, the entire Mediterranean is an Italian lake. It's meant to be ours, nobody else's. And all these lands around them arguably were theirs. Well, they're not going to go get Marseille because they know France has had that for a long time. They're going to leave the Iberian Peninsula alone because Spain's kind of settled. But hey, over here, this has really been a play place for the Ottoman Empire and then later the Austro, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. So to the Italian mind in 1919, we should get it. Again, the challenge of one of the things Wilson introduces that I, I will stress, I've mentioned it once, but let me stress it again, that for me is disastrous. And maybe I should say sets up the larger debate we're experiencing right now is his concept of self-determination. In the 14 points, and in many of the speeches Wilson is saying, he's loosely stating the people who live here should get to decide what their government is. When you say it like that, we're all like, yeah, that makes sense, right? But what it misses is the European history, which, by the way, Wilson was a historian. So every time I get this with Wilson, I'm always frustrated. I'm like, dude, you of all people should have known better. But maybe he didn't study European history. Regardless, when you have, as we do, not just here, think about the city of, of think of Central Florida, right? Not just Orlando. Imagine you were going to let self-determination take root. Well, we know places in our map that there's more of one ethnic group than another. But there's no place on our map where 100% of the repres- of people who live there are of one specific group. And when we say Hispanic or black or white, you and I know that's misleading. Because I'm a German, so don't throw me with the Italians, because I ain't got nothing to do with the people. And certainly don't put me with any Irish people. I'm a German, right? You're gonna get, if you're going to get narrow, well, then where's the German people going to live? How far down do you want to divide? And then what are you going to do with the people who live there who aren't German? You can say, oh, those are white people. I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. That guy's Irish. That guy's Italian. That guy's a Brit. I don't want them around me. Is that, can you see how messy that becomes? So when you say self-determination, it sounds great at kind of a large-scale level. But when you drill down into the nuance of it, particularly in a Europe that has been largely multicultural for a long time, again, think of Italy. There's nobody saying, I'm an Italian in 1850. They're saying, I'm a Sicilian. I'm a Roman, I'm a Venetian, right? I'm from Lombardy. What's this Italian thing you're talking about? So even on the peninsula, these different people groups, if you had said self-determination, would drill down into smaller. This is the debate that is consistently happening through history as was kind of both a poll to the various, would it be better if Winter Park was its own nation in, in the UN? Would it be better for society, for your society, would it be better if you were part of the United States of, of the Americas and from Chile to Canada, we had like 120 states, we were one nation. That poll to the large to the small is a consistent thing throughout world history. And you can track world history by watching at moments people thinking the large is better. And then there's a counter view of no, 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 the small is better. And there's not a right answer. There's just what you perceive to be right. But then the tension in that, if we disagree deeply, then we're going to clash within the, you know, the civic society in which we live in as to which way we want to go, right? And one of the things that comes out of this idea of self-determination is it loops back to nationalism, which was one of the isms. And I would suggest that since World War II, particularly since probably the 1990s, one of the growing debates geopolitically in our world today is... Is it better for there to be separate nations, or are we so interconnected that any pursuit of something separate and national is really a net negative? It's, it's a bad idea. And again, I don't, I mean, I have my own opinion, but it doesn't matter. That debate, I would offer, does not have an easy answer or even a correct answer, but that's what we're wrestling with. And when you see that being wrestled with in 2023, so I mentioned the Kurds who desire since 1919 to have Kurdistan, which they were promised by Woodrow Wilson in the United States. You can go, that's terrible. They should just see themselves as part of the larger world. Or you can say, no, that's what it should be, where there's this nation of Kurdistan, Kurd people. Does that make sense? So 
how you feel about that's your thing. But where does that tension come from? It comes from nationalism of the 1800s. But I would say that has been largely exacerbated by Woodrow Wilson's promise and ergo the United States' promise of self-determination. Okay, so the Italians are saying, hey, look, we were robbed of land that should have been ours, and they would argue in some of these places in certain cities, the majority of people living there were Italians. So they should be ours, but they weren't given that. And in fact, up here in this area, there were actually more Germans living than Italians, but they got that land. Now this is gonna be something that Hitler's really gonna play into as he goes along, which we will get to, I promise. Now, this brings us to Mussolini. In 1919, this is so important. Again, when we cheapen it, when we say World War II and 39, there were these guys, Hitler, Mussolini, they were crazy. And we sort of think they were evil dictators who took over. We miss it. So Mussolini in 1919 had been part of a socialist political party, but had decided it wasn't strong enough and it didn't focus enough on the nation of Italy. And as the events of 1919 came out, Mussolini and the group he founded were a group that said, we got screwed and we did not get things that belonged to us, things we were promised by agreement and where people who were Italian live, ergo self-determination, was not fulfilled. And we want that. He calls his group, as you can see, the Fasci di Combatti, the Fighting Leagues, and it comes from an old Roman term, the Fasces, which is this thing here. It is a collection of rods that has an ax in it that's all bound up. And the short version of it is that in the time of the Roman Republic, the consuls and political leaders were allowed to walk around with basically, we would say, guys protecting them, you know, like our Secret Service walks around with the president or people running for office or important people, and they would carry this stick. And the point was, if you were on the outside and you were a citizen and you saw a politician you didn't like and you wanted to go give him a piece of your mind, you recognize his bodyguard had these weapons. And they could unwind the weapons and give every one of them a stick and begin to beat the snot out of everybody who might be trying to bother the politician. That's where the word comes from. It also signifies bound up strength through unity, which if you're thinking in nationalistic terms, that sounds great. Okay? Now this leads us to a very complicated subject. What does fascism mean? It's something that we still grapple with today. It's uh, the going slur online. Um, you can be involved in a conversation about anything, your favorite sports team or something, and if you step over a line somebody else thinks they don't like, they may drop the F-bomb on you and call you a fascist. <laughs> You've been there. You've seen it. This is almost always a gross misuse of the word. In fact, to really throw you a curveball, most people will tie fascism to Germany rather than Italy, and there's no evidence at all that the Germans were ever fascist. Hitler and the Germans we'll see in a minute, they did a different thing that have similarities in its output so that for us, we can simplify by saying, hey, all those things out there that have different names, I'm just gonna call them fascist. That seems to match what I understand fascism does. And, and that's fair. But I think what's happened to us is we then misuse the word in a way that robs it of what I would suggest we maybe should be concerned about. And just becomes like a simple slur that kind of doesn't understand what it's doing. In particular, once we put Germany into it, we know the horrendous and um, terrible thing that happened racially based, in particular Jewish people, but far beyond Jewish people gets looped into fascism, and that's technically not what fascism is about. Although, fascism leans deeply into Nietzsche and the idea of the superhuman, which then sounds for most of us like, oh, there's some people who are superhuman, so they must be kind of racially or some other way better than the rest of us. I think that's fair. But except for the Italians tragically shipping off all their Jews to Germany, there's actually no moment really, Libya is a question we could get to in a second, where the Italians mimic that. So what is fascism? Well, fascism are these things. 
centralized authority, single leader, strong nationalism, social control of the different economic pieces, usually individual rights subservient to the group. It's precisely what the Spartans do. So anytime you watch the movie 300 and cheer because you think the Spartans are cool, you could arguably be cheering for a version of what we might call fascism because the individual is subsumed into the group. You're not supposed to have an opinion and you're not supposed to voice your opinion because the group, i.e. the nation, is what you want to see happen. You're willing to die for Sparta because the totality of Sparta is more important than your individual life. That's the thing we're dealing with. It is important to see this. The centralized authority single leader rule. I'm not going to show the slide. Some of you have been here before. You think I might have a slow show. But in the majority of human history, that is the normative state. Government led by a single powerful leader at the top. So we can't read what happens with Mussolini or Hitler or Franco as some sort of aberration in which the people get screwed. What we have to read in that is at least a, um, a similarity to what seems to be the normative state for the species that we like the daddy figure who takes care of us. And again, there's a much longer story through human history, which I'm more than willing to engage with you if you don't believe me on that point. Okay, now, so then what happens? Well, because of the outcome of 1919, the war, Italy, like every place else, was largely in chaos. Economically, they were in trouble. And Mussolini begins to kind of press through the electoral process. He gets elected into parliament. At the same time as he's using his black shirts, his kind of club group, to go around and kind of pick fights. In other words, in Italy, you begin to see the, the reality of political parties having their own paramilitary organizations, and they begin to get into it with each other, to do violent interactions. Be, imagine you and I going to the Regal or going to Publix or going over to the mall somewhere, and all of a sudden we see a whole bunch of people roll in with green, and then a few minutes later, about 20 cars roll in with red, and you know they're gonna start shooting at each other. You'd run for your life, obviously, but then the next time you thought about going to the Regal, next time you thought about going out to the grocery store, you might go, mm, oh, I don't know if I want to do that or not. Right? A nation or a, a civic society is stable when the central civic society has the kind of dominant monopoly view, uh, state stance of force. There's nobody else in the re region who can outgun the nation. And what happens to Italy, and to a lesser degree Germany, what happens to Italy is the state no longer had a monopoly on force. And both the socialist political parties and the fascist political parties basically weaponized their supporters to where, from our point of view, there was like open warfare happening. In this setting, Mussolini took his chance to challenge the king. And he organized what they called the March on Rome. And he gathers fascist supporters from all over the nation ends up with this rather large group. We're not sure exactly, but somewhere between 30, 40,000, which is a large group. And they march to Rome. When they march to Rome, they basically tell the, the king, you have lost control of society. We are one of the majority political parties. You need to name us as, part, as, the, as the prime minister. Now, if you know your parliamentary system, you know what should happen is there's elections, whichever party has the majority gets to set up the prime minister to start form the government. The fascists were not the majority party. So the prime minister at the time basically begs the king to declare martial law. He won't do it. And so the prime minister resigns, and once he resigns, that gives the king the opportunity that Mussolini wants, which is the king says former government. Mussolini's promise is, I can stop the violence. When you and I, of course, walk into the sidelines, we're like, well, of course you can stop it. You're the one who started it, or you at least contributed deeply to it. I don't want to let the socialist political parties off here. But in general, the fascist party was often the aggressor in these confrontations. And it does exactly what he says. He is able to calm things down, and he is made the, um, the prime minister. Now, you can argue with me, like I will say Mussolini's elected to office. You could argue and say, yes, but he's still forced becoming the prime minister in a kind of non-elective way. Okay, but I still think it's important for us to get in our heads that this is an elected official 
elected by citizens of the state saying, let me be in charge. In this, for the next two years, he basically will keep things in a traditional way. He'll work through the parliament. He'll have um, uh, you know, normal elections. He, he won't necessarily squash uh, free speech in the press. But as it rolled into the end of 24, and Italy's economic situation had not improved, Mussolini decided it was time for him to take further action. And this is the moment in which we could correctly say Mussolini takes power and becomes a dictator, or the term he liked, il duce, which is an old Roman term for, for leader in the process. In it, he sets up a one-party system. He brings in heavy censorship, basically makes it illegal to be in another political party. And then, as we've seen in certain nations around the world today who claim to be either, well, a government of the people, yes, there's elections, there's only one political party, so of course, the person who's in top wins, we would suggest that's not really a fair election. But nonetheless, the Italians, like those current states today, can argue, oh yeah, it was, we had an election, just like you guys in America, and this is who was elected. With 97% of the vote, so we're a lot more popular than you. Your, your guy voted, voted in with 50, right? So that kind of a thing. And he does end the conflict, basically by arresting and or killing anybody with the Socialist Party groups, and kind of eliminates them. And the Italian people largely loved it. They would say, he made the trains run on time. I could go to the store and there's no crisis. These were true things. So they felt really good about themselves in the process. What's happening in Japan? Japan also leaves quite bitter. They're very frustrated. Now what's happening in Japan at this moment is that the Japanese have spent the last, say, 25 years kind of coming out of their self-isolation. And in doing so, they want to be part of the, the cool kids club. They want to be in the group of nations who make the decisions. And so they went to school on all the powerful. They sent all their young people off and they went off to school in Germany and um, in France and the United States and just to learn what were they doing. And they learned several things. And one of the things that they learned was this idea the Americans had called the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine simply stated was our hemisphere, we're going to manage. We're the strongest, we're the biggest, we'll take care of everybody else. If you're not in our hemisphere, don't come over here. That was the general idea behind the system. When Japan signed their treaty with England going into World War I, in Japan's mind, this meant England at least had agreed to this premise. Hey, the Americans will have their hemisphere. And the British will control, no, a lot more, but basically the Atlantic and Europe and Africa and all that. And we, Japan, will take care of our hemisphere, certainly the West Pacific. It'll be all ours. In the mindset of most Japanese, or many Japanese at this point, there's a frustration of the fact that most Asian peoples from what was called the Dutch East Indies all the way up to Japan itself was controlled or manipulated by the Western powers a variety of means. So from Japan's point of view, they're like, we're just like the United States when James Monroe did this in 1820. There are other nations in our hemisphere messing with our people, our brothers and sisters in our lands, and we're going to get rid of you guys. Leave. I'm going to keep that in mind and kind of understand the rest of the way to which they're going to go. There were people who were thinking about this, kind of pushing this nationalism, um, this gentleman here, Iiki Kita, uh, writes, as you can see, in 1919, what becomes a really popular writing in Japan at this time, in which he spells out what I basically just told you with a lot more detail. You can see some of the places he specifically focused on, China, Korea, Indochina. And the idea is that we need to be stronger as a nation, and he would suggest, and this is what we'll see happening, that political leaders cannot pull this off. It needs to be done by military leaders. Now, there's a, now, that's not at the expense of the emperor. So they're not saying overthrow the emperor, but they're saying underneath the emperor who guides and leads us, who's operating or working out all of the aspects of society, it ought to be military leaders, not elected people, because quite honestly, elected people are corrupt and they can be bought and they don't have honor. Now, there is an aspect of something that's happening in Japan at this point. I'll just mention on the side. 
Um, and that is, if you know Japanese history at least a little, you have you know the samurai, and you know basically what I call the samurai culture, which is a culture of honor. Um, if you watch Tom Cruise's movie, The Last Samurai, particularly get the DVD, but they don't make those anymore, right? But you can look at the bonus features, Google it, you can find it online. They kind of lay out the sense of honor. And in the story, you see Cruise's character as an American. He seems corrupt, and he's dirty physically and mentally, and kind of a bunch of issues. And the samurai who captures him is honorable and good and just, and teaches Tom to, to view the, the flower and spend hours, you know, so there's beauty to that. And there's an argument made by Japanese historians or historians in the Japanese field that what happens to Japan at this moment in this early 20th century is that there begins to be a corruption of the, the, the samurai co concept, the Bushido code. So it begins to be twisted to the point that when you hear this writing, you can kind of read in what he's suggesting that we only find honor in these military people who can use force to get something done which is, I would suggest, not what the samurai believed in, but you kind of can twist that into that story. Well, this gets worked out in the moments when they're most frustrated. One of the things that happens between the war is the fact that um, as you go along, the great powers are trying to figure out ways to avoid any future wars. So in 1921, the United States hosted what was called the Naval Conference. They brought in the nine, 10 biggest naval producing nations and said, let's have a conversation. Let's work on an agreement together to limit ourselves. Part of this is, again, if you know your World War I history, the naval arms race was a key component to getting into that war. So they thought, we'll work together. It's one of the great moments where you can see the divide that's beginning to happen between Japan and the United States. In the end, there's several treaties, but the most famous one listed the nations and said, here's the number of ships you can build. They actually did it by tonnage, but it's easier for most of us to think in numbers, like 12 ships, 10 ships. The number of capital ships, cruisers, destroyers. There's no aircraft carriers at this point. And they listed. And because we hosted, <laughs> us and England were number one. We're number one. So we can build the boats, most ships. And Japan was next, so they're number three. From our point of view, it's like, way to go, Japan. I mean, 10 years ago, you wouldn't even have been invited. Look at you, you're, you're third, this is awesome. <laughs> but clearly, Japan saw it differently. Because in their minds, this was yet another example of the West, and in particular, the United States, disregard and perhaps open discrimination against them because they're Asian or Japanese. So in their minds, particularly going back to World War I and the decision to be part of the Great Alliance with Great Britain, they should have been equal with us and Great Britain. Now, whether they should or shouldn't, not the point. The point is they walk away from this upset. And like most arms limitations treaties, it's actually going to lead us further into war rather than away from war. Historically, that, that's sadly the case. Not always, but it's sadly the case. So as you can see, we privately begin to put pressure on the UK to kind of break your deal with Japan. And so when the 23, 23 comes, the alliance concludes from the previous, there's no re-upping that alliance. So now Japan is kind of bereft of a friend on their side, and the United States and Great Britain get closer together. In case you aren't aware, most of you probably know this, England, Great Britain, UK, they're not our friend. We've not been friends with them, except out of this time period. We become closer friends, and then obviously, as we'll see in December, when FDR and Churchill really linked together with the Atlantic Charter in 41, that, so we've really only been friends with the UK for about 80 years. From 41 to say the 90s, we were kind of frenemies. And from 1890 back, they were our first enemy. If you were listing who's our most concerning country to fight with or what, what they're doing, well, it's England. They're a bunch of troublemakers. Right? And plus, we won in Canada. So in the process, right, Japan's frustrated because, wait a minute, these guys shouldn't be friends. But they are, and from Japan's point of view, they get left out of the story. So through the 20s, a lot of what was being proposed begins to work out for the Japanese. And you can see there's a variety of things that kind of happen for them. There's some economic issues, there's some environmental issues. They have some problems with their banking system. 
and there's problems in their um, kind of electoral system. One of the things that the Japanese do, and this is a good thing, is they expand who gets to vote. So all of a sudden you had a larger group of young men who got to vote, who were reading Hikita's materials, who were thinking Japan should be and is a great nation, Japan should be equal to the others, Japan's being kind of put upon by these Westerners who are not accepting them. And so they begin to vote and maneuver and kind of metaphorically march in line with we need to be respected and we're not. And so this leads them down that road that they're heading to kind of put more, um, more military leadership involved. When the emperor dies in any of the Taisho era, th this becomes like a really key moment for them. Because you're going to have a young emperor who kind of imbibes this sense of vitality and let's go make Japan great. Let's get out there and be seen as an equal partner to all the players. What's happening in the West? Well, we're in chaos. Both in France and in England, they're struggling to make sense of themselves. Remember what I told you in 1919, 1917, I mean, both those countries were teetering on their own internal civil war that could have worked out into a British or French communist revolution as it did in Russia. There were strong movements in those. And by the way, I'm not saying that'd be a bad thing. In my class, all the governing systems are amoral. So they're, they're just different systems, and then you examine what happens, where it exa happens, and then you conclude. So if you're a good communist in here, cool for you. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with you totally, but don't you feel like I'm putting that idea down. But it would, would have been chaotic. But those ideas that come out of both socialism and communism that says the common person needs to be protected were growing root. Those ideas that say the common person needs to have the support of the government. If there's a problem in the, in the society, people are poor, the government needs to do something. This, by the way, is a brand new concept. And they're not even sure how it would work out economically. Right? That's one of the things we've been kind of battling for about 100 years. How does it work out economically? Uh, and I was just watching a documentary this morning about things that are, you know, what's happened to um, Venezuela's economy. Right? And it's too long for this, but just. The experts who I'm listening to and learning from, they're walking down these same roads that are happening here. How do we fund something if there's no money coming in but you're giving all the money out? And how do you avoid inflation? How do you avoid the devaluing of the currency? So in England, they're kind of going back and forth. This will be the death moment, largely, of the liberal political party. And it will be the birth or the growing strengthening of the labor political party. But it'll be kind of a back and forth with these guys as they kind of figure out what to do. Um, one of the crucial decisions that they make, which will have a lot to do with kind of how things roll out, you have to remind yourself that at this moment, England is like the sheriff for the world. That they're, the, they're the world's policemen. They're the ones who kind of run the show going into World War I. They're the largest and strongest, right? And they had some systems in place to defend their priority on military spending so that they maintain that spot. But with the coming of these questions post-World War I, England makes a decision that says, hey, we're going to try to divert money from um, military spending to social spending. And so they passed what was called the 10-year rule. And the 10-year rule was basically we're not going to spend any money at all, if we can avoid it, on anything militaristic. And again, to, to reflect that for you, going into World War I and for the previous hundred years, they had had a rule that basically said, we will maintain the largest navy over all other navies, and we will have more ships than the next two nations combined. Well, you can already see with the Washington Naval Conference, they kind of walked away from that. And it's okay if you go, well, that's a good idea. We, we spend too much money on military stuff anyway. No argument for me. But what it will mean is, as other nations are ramping up their military spending, it runs the risk of England being incapable of confronting those nations. And again, to bring it back here to home, regardless of my personal or your personal view of, say, the police, in a general civic society, you don't want anybody in your neighborhood who can outgun the police. It's the same thing I said about the nation. The nation must have a monopoly on force. And that applies, in my opinion, at the lowest levels if you want stability of a civic society. 
If you want to go with Rousseau and live in an anarchist position, which is totally cool again, you can be an anarchist and I have full support for you in that idea, then you don't need police because you don't need rules and nobody gets elected because we're all nice and good. Right? But if you don't think that's the way you think is best, you're going to need somebody to enforce the rules and you don't want the police in your city or neighborhood to be outgunned. But if they say, oh, we're just not going to spend any more money, well, the bad guys might. And so that's where England's going to find themselves in struggle. And as you can see, they have a coal strike in 26. There's some economic challenges that are happening in them post-war. Their economy's basically in shambles. And both England and France had banked on the idea of getting money from Germany. Part of the outcome of World War I, as you may remember, I didn't mention it, is the reparations concept. Germany's guilty. They really weren't. But Germany's guilty. They got to pay for the war. And so England and France, if you ask them in, say, 1920, how are you going to pay for all this stuff? Oh, well, the well, Germans are going to pay for it, really. But Germany was also kind of economically in collapse. So that doesn't work out. So both England and France are kind of struggling. As you can see for the French, I mean, they don't know who they want to be, which if you were here when I did the French Revolution conversation, that's true for them anyway after the French Revolution. And so they're trying to figure things out. Because they don't trust the Germans, which is fine, they maintain for a while the world's largest military, which is expensive. And as you know, we'll get there in a minute, they're eventually going to try to build a very expensive setting of forts to try to augment and build up their defenses against their perceived enemy of Germany. So it's very expensive in the process. Um, what's really interesting that happens in this time period um, is the fact that you're going to see the French try to reach out to the United States to see if they can loop us into an, into an agreement. But in general terms, France begins to be seen by many of the world leaders as more of the problem than the solution. So Germany fails to pay them in 1923, and so near them on the Rhine River is the Ruhr Valley. So France goes and gets it. There's a lot of factories are. The Germans have basically said, we're not going to work. And the French military showed them and said, yes, you are. Well, this looks bad in the minds of most people. And by the time you get to 24, 25, there's already this growing consensus that the Treaty of Versailles was a terrible mistake. And both England, well, particularly England, feels guilty. And France often was the person who was kind of given the, um, the negative opinion, like, this is your fault. Like, this bad idea has happened, and it's your fault, because you're the one who really got, the, got us there with Clemenceau and French frustration. Which, when you study the, the Treaty of Versailles, and you say World War One, you can only say, well, France has a reason to be frustrated, right? So there's that whole issue there. I'm not trying to say France is guilty. In fact, it's probably better to say nobody's guilty. All right, so, so there's France, right? Um, and then, as I mentioned, France reach out, reaches out to us. Now, this coincides in America of a growing, as I mentioned to you, kind of desire for, as America, to just not participate with the, the world geopolitically. So we're not in the Treaty of Versailles. But this is the time of President Coolidge, and the French show up with a secret offer. Now, it's been kind of promoted, as you can see by these guys, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So in the United States, there are various groups who were beginning to emerge who were, we would say, peaceniks uh, or, or pacifists, which is great. You can be that, too. And they wanted there to be no more war. And again, I, I would say one of the challenges that's happened since the 1800s and the coming of the Enlightenment is this idea that there is a thing called progress in the human so that the human changes for the better over time. And that's usually verbalized in a lot of different ways. And I would just offer that the historical evidence says no to that. And we can work on that later if you want to. But in the process, what they're thinking is we could somehow create a system. This is pre-UN. We could create a system in which law, uh, war is outlawed. I mean, to me, one of the most hilarious things that you often hear about the Russia-Ukraine story is that people are like, oh, Putin or Russia, they broke the rules. And all of us who are old enough know the story of, there's no rules in love and war. Sorry. 
And it frustrates us because we want to believe that if there's a law written, people will obey it, but then you drive on I-4 and you know that's not true. <laughs> so that's a challenge for us as a species. We have a law, but we say, yeah, I don't feel like it. And I'm not hurting anybody. Back to Rousseau. Leave me alone. I'm not hurting anybody. And so in this process, um, this man here, um, uh, Aristide Briand, comes and basically is suggested and kind of secretly tries to pull us into a secret agreement. Coolidge isn't having it. He gives his, his guy, Kellogg, orders to go tell everybody else about it. Now again, remember, out of World War I, we have, according to Wilson, a solution for conflict. The conflict solution is we will talk about it together in a reasoned and calm way where the League of Nations. Think of the League of Nations as UN version one. That's the idea of Wilson and the progressives. If we could just talk about it, peace will prevail. But of course, we didn't join. So you can't really talk about it with us. And of course, part of the premise I would offer for the UN or the, or the League of Nations is that there's a silent or else. We're gonna talk about it, work it out, or else. Well, the or else has got to be backed up with something, right? And I'm a critic of the UN and of the League of Nations, because, mostly because it gives us a false hope. But that's a different conversation. Clearly, if your or else does not include one of the most powerful nations, because it didn't include Germany, it didn't include the USSR initially, it doesn't include the US, how are you going to actually pull off the or else? So now you're just talking, and with no real threat when you need to tell somebody, hey, cut that out, you can't do that. So this is a way to try to get us in. But what it really does is undermine the League of Nations because now you have a competing group. Are you paying attention? Right now there's a thing called the G20 that's meeting. Theoretically, they're only talking about economic stuff. They made a decision today to include the African Union. Well, we can applaud that and say, yay. My first thought when they did it was like, well, we might as well just call this the UN about money. But we have the World Bank that supposedly already is the UN about money. I'm not giving you a solution, but do you see how now you've got two competing groups? We already have that with NATO. Don't get me started. Um, so, as you can see, a lot of people get involved, and it fails immediately with the first major crisis that occurs. Because it's all talk if you're not really willing to do something about it. All right. So this takes us to Germany. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're good. All right. So Germany, what's probably a lot of you waiting on. 1919, at the time before the Treaty of Versailles, the Germans want to try to position themselves in the best light possible. So they forced their king to abdicate. Kaiser Wilhelm did not abdicate willingly. And they constructed a new government in the city of Weimar, near, it's near Frankfurt, and they built a constitution. Beautiful city, I've been there, it's a lovely place you should go. And in the, so, this, so the city always gets connected to the government. It's really the German government, like we have the U.S. Constitution, the German Republic, but because of what happens in its short-lived amount of time, it's always called by the city it's from, so the Weimar Republic. When you read Weimar Republic, don't think that's some other place. It's just Germany. And so they basically wanted to reach out to us, because when the Germans surrendered or appealed for the armistice, they did it on the backs of the 14 points. They walked into that train car in 1919 saying, 14 points, we'll surrender on this, let's have our conversation, we'll have a general meeting like we did in 1815, and we'll all go home happy. And the French were like, uh, no. And this is the beginning, really, of the breakdown between Clemenceau and Wilson, because Wilson was frustrated with different conversation. But in general, that's where they want to go. So they mimic a lot of their government off of the United States. Not in total, that's some differences. So they have a president and a chancellor. So it's kind of like having a king and a prime minister. And they both had different roles to play in their process. The president's more about the political power. The chancellor's more about the day-to-day -day activity. But for our purposes, one of the most inc interesting points, which is not that abnormal, was they had in there a statement, which happens to be number 48 in the, in the Constitution, that if there's crisis in the government or in the country, the chancellor can basically take a pseudo-dictatorial role, eliminate all kind of voting and what we might call republic or citizen-based decision-making, and solve the problem. 
Now I mentioned this to you because it's so critical because when the Reichstag fire happens in a second, I'm gonna show you, and Hitler issue goes after, uses Article 48, you cannot think that evil turkey dictator, I knew that guy was bad. He used this thing to kind of make it bad for the Germans. It was used dozens of times between its inception in 1919 and his a final takeover as dictator in, the, in like 32, 33. Right? So in other words, Hitler, when he has the opportunity, is merely able to use what the previous chancellors had used and had been applauded about using. That is a signal for us to recognize the complexities of these moments that occur in our challenge. So everybody loved it, right? No, unfortunately, what I told you earlier about the Italians is true here. And particularly in Central Europe, where they had just spent the last, well, arguably throughout their known history. So back all the way up to the Germanic tribes that come across the Rhine River in the 400s that Julius Caesar fights with in the first century BC, these Germanic tribes had single leader rule, which again is the model for the species. Power pyramids, the phrase I use, single dude on top makes all the decisions. And sorry ladies, it is almost always a dude, okay? And so the German people were used to that. One of the, I would suggest, well, let's use that word. One of the struggles we have in our minds is that we think what we've been told by the Enlightenment Project is true, and that is that everybody wants to be in a democracy, everybody wants to vote for things, everybody wants citizen rule. And that's fundamentally false on the face of it based on human history and the evidence we have. We're the weirdos of history. I hope you like those things. I love those things. I don't want to be in a single leader rule. I like the attempt we have, but when we call it an experiment, you and I today, we're the ones wearing the lab smock. We're the ones watching the beakers and the dials. And if we're not paying attention, it will collapse really quickly because the normative state is to just let dad do it. Just let daddy do it. It's just easier that way. And I can just play on my Xbox or go do my job or whatever. I'll watch the NFL tomorrow. I mean, it's all good. I don't have to worry about this stuff. So as they struggled in Germany in the 20s, economically and psychologically, this is gonna be a problem. One of the things that happens, in fact, with this line here, is when you go here, is that when it was mostly written, it was written by this gentleman here, Hugo Proust, but he happened to be Jewish. So this will play in for where people who are critics of the government are going to go. There's a long and tragic history of, of anti-Semitism in Europe that far predates the coming of the Nazi party so that people hate on or dislike or disgruntled by or discriminate against Jewish people is also tragically, at least in Europe, normative. And so Proust being in on it was a problem for Germans who found themselves unhappy. So then this brings us to here. Before Hitler, these three gentlemen here formed the German, German Workers' Party. Now, Hitler was still active with the military, kind of what they did with a lot of soldiers who had lived through the wars, they gave them jobs. And Hitler's job in, the mil in, in his role was as a spy, basically, and they had several of these people, and there were all kinds of political groups forming and meeting and having conversations about their frustrations, mostly about the Weimar Republic. And the German army was trying to maintain control of this. And so they wanted to know what people were saying. Now, in particular, they were worried about the rise of communism, but they just wanted to find out all the ins and outs of these groups. So these young men, like Hitler, would go to these club meetings and sit privately and have a beer and take notes. And then they report back to the high command as to what were they talking about. And they broke up groups they thought were dangerous, the German command. They looked for groups that were communist, those were really dangerous, we don't like them. Well, Hitler happened to go to this one. Now, at this point in Hitler's life, as a lot of people who are in their late 20s and 30s, he's wondering, what am I going to do with my life? Where am I supposed to go? And, as some people have, he had a quite exalted view of himself. And his view was, I know I'm destined for something great. I don't know if it should be politics or business, but man, I want to find it. That's where he was mentally when he went to this first group. When he left, he wrote in his diary a version of this. Well, these guys have some good ideas, but they're, I don't know if they're really serious. Is this the thing I should get involved with? And he was considering not getting involved with it. Then some of the people from the group went to visit him, like clubs often do. Hey, you came to visit our group. I'm so glad. We want to tell you more about it. You should come back. So he came back. And once he came back, 
One of the things that's a positive about Hitler, we don't, it's hard for us because we find German a guttural language and it's hard to, oh, God, no, I don't like We hear that very negatively. Is that he was an amazing speaker. He was extraordinarily suave and, and this bugs some people because of the whole mustache thing, to a lot of women, he was very attractive. So there was a magnet, magnetic viewpoint or a kind of sense of who Hitler was in the early uh, 1930s. And he basically began to lead this group and kind of dive in. He helped them change the name to be the National Socialist Workers Party, which is this long thing in German, which I'm not insult you by trying to read out loud. That's where we get the word Nazi from, that word there. And in February, he wrote out a 25 port platform. If you read Mein Kampf, which we'll get to in a second, it's the same thing. And it's basically a list of what needs to happen. And these are some of the big ones, right? We should have unification of all Germans, self-determination. The peace of Versailles was a disaster. Anybody can be in if you're German, but of course no Jew can be in. Um, socialism, so this, again, you have to understand, particularly for the Nazis, but also for the fascists, so I'm also using those words intentionally. When I say fascists, there's only the Italians. When I say Nazi, it's the Germans, two different groups, right? particularly for the Nazis, but also for the fascists, it is a socialism. Socialism as a, as a concept is a big umbrella. So you can have a very conservative group over here, the Nazis, who hate, it's in their, it's in their DNA, they hate communism. And communism is also socialism. It's over here on this side. So it, it makes it very difficult for you and me to kind of put our head around because it feels like we, we want it narrow, and it's not narrow, it's broad. Okay, so there's that process, right? Now, in early 21, then, he decides to roll the dice and threatens to quit because he was competing with these other leaders and he thought he could lead them to greatness politically and save the German nation. They bow to his pressure and the moment he takes over, he basically models Mussolini and builds his own group of kind of paramilitary group, the SA as we know them, who wore brown shirts. So in Italy, you have the black shirts, it's the political paramilitary group. In Germany, you have the brown shirts, which is the Nazis paramilitary group. Again, I stress to you, they weren't the only political parties that had these kind of fisticuffs, paramilitary type, we'll go mix it up in the street, we'll shoot, we'll fight, we'll, we'll go to your club and basically have a fight. They would go often into bars where they knew other political parties were meeting of a variety of types, and then they would just start punching people which is aggressive, obviously. Um, but one of the things they do, and you can see this little ad here, is they try to basically begin communicating the message to the German people that we were screwed out of the Treaty of Versailles and we are threatened on all sides. It's tough to see, but here's a little German army with its 100,000, which you and I think it's a large number. But you can see just from the scope of how they drew them, all the other nations, including Czechoslovakia, have much larger armies than they do, and they all hate Germany. So this messaging gets important, it gets kind of put in. And so by um, the time he gets 1923, Hitler decides this is his moment to copy Mussolini. Another thing that's important, we'll stress this more next, next time in December, a lot of us perceive the Axis powers or World War II or the bad guys as Hitler and then Mussolini. In the 1920s, it's Mussolini and then, well, nobody else. And as Hitler rises up in his opportunities, there's a lot of mimicking. And that will change positioning when you get right to the war, which we'll talk about it in that process, which has some interesting stuff that goes on. So they attempt to do the same march on Rome, except they're going to do it in Munich, which Munich is the capital of Bavaria. And he figures, if I can do it here, I'll take over here, then I'll be able to go on to Berlin. Except here, unlike the Italians, the government defends itself. And long story short, Hitler gets arrested. Well, he first thought this was a bad deal until the trial came. And when he was on trial, he basically was given free reign of the microphone. And remember what I told you, magnetic, brilliant speaker, able to clearly explain positions that were already resonating within the German people. And his speeches were basically transcribed in full in the newspapers. So instead of being a disaster, it was really like his cotillion, his coming out party to the rest of Germany who may not have heard of the Nazi party, which was again locally a Bavarian thing. 
And now all of a sudden, people will be going, oh, I like what this guy's got to say. He's put in minimum security prison. It's a five-year time. He's not even there for a full year. While he's there, he puts his 25-point plan into print to maximize his opportunity, my struggle, Mein Kampf. And in Mein Kampf, he lays out basically this short version of what is our problem and what do we need to fix. If we'll fix these things, we will have solved our situation going forward. So now you've seen the major players. You think we maybe could start the war right now, but there needs to be something that happens that kind of kickstarts the crisis. And that is the United States Great Depression. Can yes? I ask you something before? So where did the hatred of the Jews come from? Why, why were they picked it, on as their, it's their fault, all the things you It's a combination about? of the fact that how the Christian church presented the Jews post-Constantine and the fact that because of the Jewish dispersion that occurred in the BC era and they were everywhere and the Christian view of money lending under the church meaning that you couldn't charge interest if you loaned somebody money if you were a Christian and at that time technically everybody's a Christian so how do you have money lending? You can't have it with another Christian. But oh, we have these people here who equally are not supposed to charge interest to themselves, but can happily charge interest to a non-Jewish person. And so much of the, of the European banking system becomes controlled and operated by Jewish people, who from their point of view had become happily French citizens and British citizens and German citizens and Swedish citizens and Polish citizens, and saw themselves in that way. And they were. But as you may be somebody who knows somebody who doesn't like what's happening with their selves economically today and they can blame their bank or their credit card for the problems, you know how easy it is to become angry at the institution of that, that entity, right? If you then tie that to, it's run by a group of people that we have long hated for a variety of reasons. You can see how they run down that road. And this is ancient. This is, this is from Constantine, so 300 AD at least, okay? Good question. Our economic disaster loops everybody else in. You know our story, so we're all kind of digging into our story, but it's bad. And we weren't sure it was going to be bad, but we should have seen it coming, but we didn't. I love Hoover's speech here in 1928 going into the election. Hey, we're going to end poverty. That's how good it is here in America. We're going to end poverty. But all these things were true already, and these things are going to be uh, the kind of the, the cracks in the mortar of our foundation. And of course, as you know, it happens. And once it happens, it's bad. And unemployment goes over 20%. You have thousands of banks losing all their money. There's no system to protect the banks. Business is going down. All of this obviously negatively impacts us and puts us in a place where we even more pull into ourselves. We just gotta take care of us. We can't be worried about everybody else. We've been trying to sort of do both, but we're gonna take care of us. One of the things that I slid past, but it's mentioned right here, um, is, uh, let's go back to this. Well, maybe it's not up there. I'm not even missing it. We had, in 25, decided we would help Europe in its financial problems by giving Germany money. It was called the Dawes Plan. That's a duty in Congress. And the Dawes Plan was we will both loan direct money to, to Germany, basically give it to them, and we'll encourage American business to invest in Germany. And of course, what, what were they supposed to do with their money? Well, they're supposed to make money, make their economy stronger, to do what? To pay France and England. Well, at the same time, France and England still owed us money from World War I. So basically, we were paying Germany to pay France and England to pay ourselves. Well, once we pull out because we can't afford it because of our Great Depression, everything else collapses down beside it. This, by the way, is one reason why the Marshall Plan is the way the, way, the, way the Marshall Plan looks, where we just gave a couple billion dollars away. Because we're like, yeah, we just blew the disaster last time. Now, Great Britain and France both are going to struggle with this. France less so initially. But this is going to be part of kind of how the weakness kind of unfolds in this process. And they kind of struggle trying to get where they need to go as far as economically. And this will lead to more pressure for socialistic responses, which is great. But it just means less energy on anything defense-oriented, defense budgeting. But the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese, and to some degree the Russians, 
we'll all go ahead and move first to the idea that the best way to strengthen the, gov the economy of a country is for the country to invest in things that they can continuously put money to. What's the best thing you can do to put money to? Military. Why the military? Well, you can invest in the car industry, and the Germans did. The Volkswagen company got billions of marks, or millions of marks, from the German economy to strengthen itself. But the average consumer buys one car, and then five, seven years later, they might buy another one. But if that same company makes Jeeps, and then you go to war, those Jeeps get blown up. And that's a good thing, because then the company gets to make more Jeeps. Hoover nor FDR can solve the Great Depression. Everybody lets us look at the, the New Deal and say, that's all the Great Depression. Not, not at all. It eased the suffering for individuals, which is wonderful and laudable. What solved the Great Depression is World War II. And we were able to put money, actually before we got in in 41, we're already investing in our, in our military. We learned that from the Germans. And the Germans and the Italians will both put this in practice, which is what ultimately will lead them to the decision of kind of charging forward into their conflict. I'm looking at the time and I'm looking at where I'm at in my slides. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is gonna be the best place for me to stop right here. There are a few more things I wanted to do, but I don't wanna press over the time and I wanted to see if there were any questions that you had to kind of get to this place. We're right here on the edge of the 30s. Hitler's about to take office. He's gonna be elected into office. He's not gonna force the issue. Um, they're gonna have a crisis that's going to occur. The Italians are going to maximize or use this opportunity militarily to kind of dive into struggle and conflict in first Libya and then Ethiopia. And the Japanese will do the same thing over out of Korea into northern, was well, basically um, China, but Manchuria. And they're going to use all three of these battles to kind of position themselves for the conflict to come, to again increase their world power or their standing in the world. But in one sense, you can look at all three moves as Italy, Germany, and Japan attempting to rectify their economy. And they can rectify their economy by being in a very small war that allows them to put more money into military spending. And, and largely, it will work. It will work economically. But with the success, particularly for the Germans who will start, they won't look at a war they can fight first. They're going to join in a Spanish war. As they start going down that road, Hitler's multi-point plan, including getting more living space and the feeling that the self-determination had basically screwed them, will lead him to take certain steps that will strengthen Germany and recover, from his point of view, and from most Germans' point of view, their greatness of place in the European hierarchy of power. Right, with that, I'm going to stop and see if you have any questions you want to ask or what we've covered today. You're a great audience. I appreciate it. Yes. It's more that the Republicans hated Woodrow Wilson. And the idea, if you think our political parties today, often their own existence is just to stop the other party from doing something that you might think, that's probably a good idea. That's unfortunately another aspect, I would suggest, of political systems that we can see. But so the Republicans were in charge of the Senate, which is where the treaties go through, and they largely hated Wilson. They didn't like the way he handled things. Him getting sick, he had a stroke, um, but him getting sick and at the end, was part of why it failed, but it was really failing before then. And so both he and the Republicans dug in and became stubborn and were unwilling to compromise. Sound familiar? Um, and because they wouldn't compromise, the decision was, well, we just wouldn't sign it. We later had our own little private peace agreement that we signed with the Germans and the Austrians, but we never contributed or got involved with the Treaty of Versailles. Thanks. Uh, was it true that like, the war with the Lock was just the US, like based off like uh, as far as World War II? Yeah. Yes, yes. So the war is going to be all around us. And so we're not really isolated from it. And obviously, if a few things gone in different directions, it might have been even more so. It's, it's really difficult to play the counterfactual and suggest that either Germany or Japan was going to land troops here um, just because of the sheer daunting distance that was involved and their own um, industrial capacity to do that. Um, but certainly, there, it was much closer to us than many people are aware of. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
didn't the concept of eugenics in the U.S. play right into Hitler? It did. So the idea of eugenics is that you can somehow use science to kind of filter out bad particles or separate groups of people. And so that was, that was that's, that's right from Nietzsche. It's right from the idea that there's a super, you know, there should be or there is a superhuman kind of person. And, you know, bad DNA could be eliminated. And unfortunately, both here and in Europe, bad DNA often meant a racial group as opposed to maybe something as we talk about today with using DNA and science, maybe there is a medical condition that people think, well, maybe we should eliminate that in potential babies and that may or may not have merit, um, but that's not where they went. They pretty much went down the road of, we could eliminate an entire group of people that we in the majority don't like. Yes, ma'am, good insight. Well, thank you very much. I hope you'll be home.